Thanks so much to all of you for coming. It's very kind of you. And uh, you know, uh, John is fabulous. Don't get your hopes up too much regarding <laughs> me. Uh, I'm embarrassed in that uh, one of my former students, who's, um, uh, whose career I followed, who I know is already a way better teacher than I ever was. Matt Palsy is here, and uh, so I'm embarrassed to even talk about teaching because he sees me in action and he knows, you know, what a, what a big liar I am. Um, but no, he really is. He really is pretty good. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I've seen his file. I know. I'm very proud of him. I have to say. Um, so I grew up on a farm and uh, went to college. And basically, I went to college to debate because I was a debater and I was like really into it. And I just, I, in four years of college, I never even thought to what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I just thought at the end. You know, if I went to law school, I'd have three more years to think about it. <laughs> so I went to law school, and uh, near the end of the first semester of law school, no, near the beginning of the second semester of law school, I got a call from the debate coach at uh, that university who said, you used to debate, right? I need somebody to teach public speaking in night school, because a guy just flaked out on me. Class starts in a week, and I'll pay you 750 bucks for the semester if you'll teach his class. And I needed 750 bucks, so I said, I can do that. Even though I had not been a speech major, I figured I could do that. And uh, I taught public speaking in night school for two weeks and told all my friends, now I know what I want to do when I grow up. 
I just enjoyed the experience so much of interacting with people and teaching people and learning material and putting into a form that other people could understand. Uh, I did it for two weeks. I said, this is what I want to do with my life. I just do it. And so uh, my first plan was to get, uh, get a PhD in history and teach constitutional history, but I ran out of money. <laughs> and, uh, so I had to go, uh, I got a federal cooking job, cook for federal judge for five years. But I knew when I leave this, I am going to go teach. And I just got fortunate enough to get a business law job um, at uh, UT. And I've been there for 36 years, and I've been happy every single day. I get up every day, and I can't wait to get to the office because there's really just no, no more fun stuff than teaching. I wish I had a great story to tell you about how I started <coughs> teaching. Uh, when I was two years old, I sat down and wrote a strategic plan about my life. <laughs> No, um, pretty much everything happened by accident, I would like to think. I, I didn't have this grand scheme of becoming a teacher, a professor, a faculty member, a chair of a department, even being part of people, uh, of the academy with people like Robert. Uh, there was no plan like that. But when I started getting into teaching, I think I fell in love with the uh, teaching is like um, something that you take once and you get hooked on and you cannot let it go. It, it becomes part of your life. If teaching is not part of your life, then I don't think most people should be teaching. I cannot distinguish between teaching and the rest of my life. And my wife has a problem with that, but that's <laughs> a different story. Um, so things just happened as they went, and here I am. Well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> um, you know, you're both outstanding teachers, uh, kind of in your own right, in your own classrooms, but you also lead departments and lead groups of teachers. And uh, in academic contexts where there are high research expectations, and you know, teaching and research often get aligned against one another. And so I wonder if you have any experience or stories or, or advice for how you individually or maybe you as a leader have helped people to balance those two domains of kind of academic life, teaching and research. Any wisdom there? I'll let you take this one first. You turn. OK. Um, when you look at our university, um, we have gone through a transition from I would like to say purely teaching school to more of a research university. And I'm talking about a major transition from having a lot of emphasis on teaching to completely turning around 180 degrees to research. We expect all of our new faculty that come to the department to have publications in A-level journals in business. That was not the case five, six, seven, eight years ago. And most of these new people that we are hiring have not been exposed to teaching because they are coming mm -hmm. from universities that put emphasis only on research, not teaching. So how do you take these people that pretty much don't know what teaching is and how to do teaching and put them in the classroom the first semester and tell them you need to do a good job in the classroom. So that was one of my biggest challenges. How do I turn a researcher into a teacher and a great researcher at the same time? So there is a lot of mentoring that is going on, a lot of flexibility, a lot of understanding, a lot of back and forth peer advising, peer evaluations, uh, as soon as they come in, we develop a plan, a teaching, a research plan for each one of our faculty members. I sit down with them and have them talk about what they think their weaknesses are, what their strengths are, and then we try to capitalize on their strengths as opposed to putting emphasis on their weaknesses. And one of the things I would like to tell them is that Teaching is something that you're going to learn for the rest of your life. You don't come into teaching, say that you know how to teach, or 
you've learned everything about teaching. It's something that you're going to keep learning. And that's an important part of teaching is that you need to be active in terms of reading about teaching, attending workshops, attending other people's lectures and see what they do well, they don't do well, and learn from those. Uh, so it's mentoring, advising, um, patience, flexibility, all those kinds of things need to come together. Um, so I've headed my department for five years, and before that it was a division, and I headed it for 15 years before that. So I've been case basically running our group for 20 years. And um, you know, one of the things I do is I try to model good teaching. It, it's the most important priority for me, and I try to make sure that everybody in our group knows it is a very important priority. Half of our teaching is done by lecturers. They don't have tenure. And so when I hire them, I say, I love you. <laughs> and um, I'm going to support you in every way I can. I'll help you do anything I can help you do. I'll bring in resources, et cetera, et cetera. But in two years, you're going to be a star or you're going to be gone. That's just it. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to fire you. And so all of our lectures in my group are fabulous classroom teachers. And that's because the ones who weren't aren't there anymore. I can control that. And I can make sure that our group is known for great teaching because half of our teachers are lecturers, and they're all studs. Uh, we had a semester recently where in the Basic Business Law Class 323, um, we taught 11 sections, and the average uh, teacher evaluation on a five-point scale was over 4.9. Mm -hmm. So they not yeah, You fell off the forms yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I got some help. I could only do about half of it. Um, then with the tenure track faculty, with one exception, in the last 20 years, I haven't hired anybody who didn't have teaching experience. Maybe just a little, maybe just a semester here, or a couple semesters there, but everybody that I, that I hired, I knew, um, or at least I thought, had the potential to be a really good classroom teacher. And then again, I tell them, look, you're gonna get tenure based primarily on your research. So we're gonna protect you, you're not gonna have to do any service until we get you promoted. We're going to hide you in the back room. You just have to do two things. Research up a storm, and yes, I know that's going to be the most important thing, but if you're not a good teacher, I'm not going to recommend you for promotion. You don't have to be as good as the lecturers have to be. You don't have to be a star, but you've got to be at least average and hopefully above average. And uh, that is now supported by the fact that uh, it's a fairly recent development, that there's now a person who is in our academy. We were on the uh, uh, conference call with him this morning back in UT, who when People go up for tenure all across the university. He's in the meeting. Oh, wow. And he can veto people based mm -hmm. on their teaching. And he knocked somebody out of uh, somebody who was up for promotion for the business school last year, mm -hmm. supported by the department, supported by the business school, did not get tenure because uh, Grant said not making it in the teaching area. So that helps me tell my people teaching is really important. And, and so uh, I've got two assistant professors just about to go up, and one of them I'm very comfortable with, uh, a fabulous classroom teacher at both the BBA and MBA level. The other one is struggling at the MBA level, and uh, he and I have sat down and had a meeting last week and talked about fixes for you know how we can how we can tweak this. He's got a couple years; he just has to turn it around because he's doing fine at the undergraduate level. But I just said, look, uh, you know, I love your research and. Uh, I really want to have you around here, but we've got to fix this MBA problem. Mm -hmm. The good news is uh, he knows it, mm -hmm. and, and he's, he's fully engaged. We have some PhD students in the room, so when you're looking at applications for new hires and you want to find that teaching experience, but also competence, what do you look for in an application? Yeah, um, so I'll go first on yeah. this one. Um, I guess the main thing, uh, what, I, what I'd love to see is just a little bit of experience. Mm -hmm. um, Decent evaluations, decent evaluations, teaching philosophy statement, that sort of basic uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, and I, and I want to be able to have a conversation with you where at the end of the conversation, I realize this is important to you. You probably realize the most important criterion in deciding whether or not you're going to be promoted is research, but I want to know that teaching is important to you. If I get the feeling that it's not, I'm just not going to hire you, period. And as I say, um, I, I've had the good fortune in 20 years, pretty much everybody that I hired, it, with one exception, uh, had had some teaching experience. So I was able to, to make a, a pretty good judgment on them. Uh, one person didn't, and uh, kind, of, kind of regretted that one. Mm -hmm. uh, 
on paper, spectacular. Mm -hmm. PhD in economics from Yale, JD from Stanford, unbelievable on paper, not so good in the classroom. That, that didn't end well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, she was let go after three years, mm -hmm. and we, we didn't get to six. We just hired uh, two faculty members this semester in, uh, in, in my department. One from Rice, the other one from the University of Utah. Both of them, one works with uh, Jay Barney, and those of you that are in management are familiar with that name, right? Um, and then the, uh, I already mentioned the other one from Rice University, is working in the digital marketing, big, big data analytics area, no teaching experience. Mm -hmm. So how do you evaluate somebody like that? They just don't teach as PhD students at, at Rice as they go through through the program. So we were looking for communication skills, uh, presentation, how he responded to our questions, our discussions that we had uh, with him individually and as a group. We invited PhD students to participate during the interviews, and we wanted to see the reactions of the PhD students, how he responded to the questions by the PhD students. Uh, we looked at what kinds of questions that he asked during the campus visit, from who are your students, uh, how do you find your students, what do you think I need to do to be able to, to connect with your students. We wanted to see interest mm -hmm. on the teaching side. We wanted to see great communication skills, and I think he, have, he has shown those, but he's gonna need a lot of mentoring, and I expected that. And I think we can provide it, and based on what we've seen, I would like to think that he's gonna become a great teacher, but he's not there yet. If I could just jump in real quick. Uh, I was hired 36 years ago, <laughs> and when I was hired, they had you give a guest lecture. Like it was, a, it was a class, and that's that's what you did. And um, after I gave mine, they offered me a job on the spot. I thought, okay, I did okay there. Uh, but now what we do, because it's the way it's done all the way across the school, is we have people present their research, and you get some sense for communication skills, but not nearly as good a sense. And and I think that's probably a mistake on our part. And that's one of the reasons I'd like to see some student evaluations from a course they taught someplace else. Thank you. Uh, staying kind of on that same frame as you as leaders, people leading groups of teachers, do you, you know, again, it ha teaching has to happen in the classroom, and that's uh, usually a kind of individual commitment, but as leaders of teams of teachers and departments, do you have any, and there are a lot of those similar folks in the room, do you have any advice for how department heads or team leaders can inspire great teaching <coughs> amongst people when they're not in the classroom, when they're not kind of doing their thing individually in the classroom, but just kind of from a distance. I think the best advice I can, I can give is making sure that good teaching permeates throughout the department. It shouldn't be just my responsibility to ensure that there is good teaching going on, but it should be everybody's responsibility to ensure that our students get the best teaching possible. So everybody knows in the department that we do care about teaching and we want our students to be challenged. Um, it's not something that I advocate on my own and when I go away, good teaching goes away with it. Uh, so from that standpoint, I think it's very important to build a culture of good teaching and everybody needs to understand in the department that that's what really matters in that particular department. The research part is given and it's expected. Uh, but teaching, I think, needs to be encouraged all the time, it needs to be part of the culture. And you need to provide some tangible ways, not just talk about it, but reward people for good teaching as well. A lot of times we, we reward people for research. Of, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional bonus in the summer for publishing top journals and so forth. And a few years ago, we said, why don't we have something like that in the teaching if, you, if you're a great teacher? 
Um, and we put something together a couple of years ago. Um, so I think communi communicating to everybody, teaching others is very important. I, I can't add much to that. Uh, reward good teaching, punish bad teaching, try to model good teaching and commitment to it to the extent you can. And um, uh, I, I go and watch all of our people teach. Uh, I, I won't see everybody in a given year, but over the course of three years, I'll see everybody in our group uh, at least once and probably more than once. So they know I, I'm taking this seriously and I'll write a review and they'll be um, reviewed by other senior people in the department as, as well, not just me, but I want them to know as, as chair, I'm going to see every single one of me in the classroom in action. John, what do you call that summer award or stipend for strong teaching? I'm just curious a little bit of the detail about that. Uh, so on the research side, we have um, typically um, we give a bonus to faculty members that publish in a level of journals. And that bonus varies every year, depending on how much money uh, there is available. I remember last year it was about $20,000 bonus to researchers. Uh, during the summer, which was a substantial amount of money for even one A-level publication. So on the teaching side, we have the major teaching awards in the college that we instituted uh, a year and a half ago. And this is the second round that is gonna happen in March. And whoever wins the department and college teaching awards now, they get $5,000 that can be spent on going to conferences and workshops outside Del Paso and Utah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, finally, I'm just curious what new trends or ideas about teaching kind of excite you these days? What do you see people in your departments doing that you just haven't seen before? It's really interesting or really making a difference for students. Um, I just like the fact that there's a lot of energy uh, around our campus for trying new stuff. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything that just bowled me over and made me think, oh gosh, I absolutely positively have to try that. Uh, it, it, I, you know, I see little things I want to try and, and, and tweak, but I haven't seen anything that makes me want to completely change the way I do things. But I do think at our campus there is a bigger commitment than there has been in quite a while to try new things and be innovative and uh, the provost put together some money, something called the Provost Teaching Fellows, where in essence, he put a bunch of geezers like me who have traditionally been good classroom teachers and kind of made us advisors for younger faculty who want to try new things. So they're not being selected because they've got great teaching records and being rewarded for that. They're being selected because they've got an idea for something that may make their teaching more effective and they want to try it. And so they get support, they get advice, and they get funding for that. And that's, we're only in our second year of that, so we're just kind of getting that off the ground. But that excites me, and um, I guess the, the best thing I've seen come out of that is a more um, nuanced, detailed commitment to uh, peer review with the process. And, and I think peer review across our campus is going to become a lot more effective than it's been in the past because of that project. I want to make sure I do something before I forget. Samira Amilpur was one of our lecturers a few years ago at Utah, so. I was also your student 15 yes. years ago. <laughs> 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 and then, um, so interesting. Mm. Yeah. It is interesting. <laughs> good teaching begets good teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Somebody this morning told me that uh, my teaching had inspired Matt to enter the profession. I said, yeah, he saw me teach and realized business education is broken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inspired to go try to fix it. <laughs> answer your question, one of the most interesting things that we started doing now is to introduce lab courses for a lot of our traditional courses that we teach in marketing, management, uh, human resource management. Uh, one of the things that we just put together was uh, is a lab course that takes advantage of uh, software and applications from major companies in human resources. For example, we've partnered with ADP, everybody's familiar with ADP. They have a system called Vantage that all of their employees have to use and the companies that they contract have to use and 
Our students now, they use that system as part of a lab course. Uh, so we are trying to introduce a lot of lab courses with a lot of hands-on work for our students and we are partnering with um, a lot of companies to do that. Well, those are my four questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. This morning I was watching uh, a webinar. It was McGraw Hill and it was talking about effective teaching. And of course, what they were trying to do is push their smart book, you know, and you may be familiar with smart books where it's a book, but it's, you put in questions and, you know, students sort of walk through it like a workbook or something. And traditionally, I've been using a regular textbook because that's what I learned. As a matter of fact, I use it. Oh, okay, you'll continue to use it. I use a great strategy book, and it's, it's really good, and I think your students can go read the book and they get all the stuff. To but what's your opinion on those little tools like smart books or other things? Are they necessary to get students engaged now? Or, I mean, do we have to sort of change and you know, try to engage students differently now than we used to? They're definitely not, in my opinion, definitely not necessary. They may be a really good way to do it, I hope it works for you, but I know it's not necessary because I I, I do stuff the old-fashioned way, and it works just fine. And I can't get my students to shut up in my class. I, Matt kind of knows how this goes. I've been trying to cover this much material so far this semester, but instead I'm covering like this much material because I can't get the little bastards to shut up. <laughs> uh, so I know they're engaged, even though I don't use fancy electronic stuff. Uh, I agree with Robert. They are not necessary. But I'm one of those people that wants to try new things all the time. But one of the things I would like to do, or that I do, is not just try it, but find whether it works or not. So there are a lot of people that try every single new thing that comes out, and then they move to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. They never know whether something really works well. By well, I mean, do the students benefit from that? So I think it's very important to go back and look at some of those things and say, how did this improve the learning or the lives of our students? Um, last semester, I, I started teaching an intro to business course. That's one of the things that you get into when somebody realized, realizes that you can do a good job in the classroom they always come to you and say, you know what, we have this great idea about a, a 350 student intro to business course, and we cannot think of anybody else that can teach that course. And you're like, well, you know, new business students, freshmen, I can have an impact, why not? Mm -hmm. What a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me about, uh, five or six months to put the course together. Uh, the course ran in the fall 2015. And then the dean said, you know what, John? I need a report about the course. I was like, no, come on. So I'm now writing a report for the last month about the course, evaluating my job in the course and the performance of the students. And Here's the interesting thing about it. It's a chore, but at the same time, I realized that I'm learning a lot of things about the way that I teach. And I'm learning a lot of things about our students. So I came up with a classification system for our students, the casual participants and the active participants, that I want to extend to things that we want to do to move the casual participants to make them active participants. Just to give you an idea of, or an example of a tool that I used in that class, and some of you may be familiar with this. So you have 350 students in a classroom. How do you keep them engaged? Um, so I came across this tool called uh, Echo360. How many of you have used that? Anybody familiar with Echo360? Yeah. How about Top Hat? Who is familiar with Top Hat? The classroom response system. Mm -hmm. Echo 360 allows you to, let's say, put something PowerPoint in. You can track exactly 
which slide the students are looking at, for how long. They can ask questions through an instant messaging system as you are discussing things in the classroom. And you can see those questions as you're, as you're discussing the things in the classroom. You can put out questions and they can respond and you can see the answers right away. So I got all of this data about my students and then I sat back and I'm like, okay, so now what do I do with this stuff? And that's the challenge with a lot of new tools is that they give you all of these choices, options, things that you can do, but I'm not sure what's useful about them. So if you decide to use any new tools, make sure you put something in place that allows you to assess whether that's something good or bad. I went back, one of the things that I did in this class was to ask the students, what did you think about the Echo 360, the things that you did on it, and was it useful, and so forth. Most of the students said they loved it. But did they learn? How did that help learning? I don't know. So, and, and that's one of those things I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, uncover and write about in this report. So study the new tools, not just use them. Great. Uh, <clears throat> for me, business school is a little bit of a culture shock. Going to engineering school at Georgia Tech in the 60s, you know, good grades and high attrition rates and all that. And one issue I'd like to, to ask about is that when you evaluate teaching, and clearly there are there are extra teachers, I mean obviously there are, but at the margin there can be other issues such as the grades that are given, and we've addressed that in some cases at the university level tenure promotion where somebody's getting really high student evaluations but they're given three six, three seven is an average grade. And I, I know it's difficult to measure the quality of work and challenge, especially when you have people in different areas of the university <coughs> assessing teaching. But uh, how do you go about trying to control for in the back here people giving away the farm and people maybe not being as rigorous versus, for example, we had one person in his first semester, he taught a huge, well, it was probably a weed out course in one of the STEM areas, I forget what it was. This person got a 3.5, I'm thinking, pretty good, anything less than a war you think is pretty good, but uh, the dean was a little negative on that, and you gotta improve your teaching, so how do you, does the system that your university's kind of control for, you know, required versus selective class size, how the grade somebody's giving, and other factors, or is it more of a reliance on the numbers, which of course is a lot easier to quantify, so when you say excellent teaching, what factors uh, really go into play to create equity across areas in university? Um, evaluations to matter. We look at the grades. I think it, it's very important, or I think it's much more interesting to me to see someone getting high teaching evaluations in the low GPA in the classroom. I think that student is, that professor, faculty member, it seems to me that the students understand that they are being challenged and they appreciate the fact that they are being challenged. Um, and the faculty member shows that that's a rigorous class. So high teaching evaluations, low GPA in the class. Now, you have to look at that very carefully, too. Why is the GPA low? And those are the kinds of things I look at as a department chair. What caused that GPA to be low? Is this somebody that is a comedian in the classroom and students don't learn, don't learn much in the classroom and students love him because he or she's a comedian? Uh, and those are the kinds of things I wanna look at. So it's not just the teaching evaluation, that's when I step in and I ask other faculty members to do that, peer evaluations, I think they're extremely important. Uh, you need to create a climate of uh, faculty or peer-to-peer -peer evaluations and 
you need to be a straight forward and honest in those peer evaluations as possible. They are not just something we have to do and we do it and we do the minimum, we put the minimum work to those peer evaluations, but it's something that needs to be done very carefully and the feedback needs to be as uh, constructive as possible. So teaching evaluations, peer evaluations, a lot of times when I do the peer evaluations at the end of the class, I ask the faculty member to leave the classroom and I stay and speak with the students about the faculty member. Mm -hmm. Do you find the students are willing to share or? The students are very constructive mm -hmm. about the feedback that they give. Mm -hmm. uh, I have much the same to say. Uh, we do rely on Student evaluation is probably too much. I think it's important. Um, we did merit review uh, for all of our accolade members two weeks ago, and we have uh, the evaluations and the grades given out in the classes side by side. Thank God, uh, we recently have gone to a system at UT where there are recommended grades and there are bands for uh, required course, uh, lower division, required course, upper division, electives, etc. And we went to that in the MBA uh, program about six years ago and in the BBA program uh, two years ago. And that solved lots of problems uh, along those lines. But we definitely know there are going to be differences in size of, size of class in the evaluations and that sort of thing. Uh, gender discrimination is something we're well aware of. And so we do take all those things into account. As you indicate, uh, peer reviews is maybe the best way to, to solve any problems you're going to have along those lines. Now, I was going to ask, when you evaluate your own personal teaching, what's the most important factor to you? What do you, when you sit back and say, have I done a good job this semester or this year, or, you know, throughout my career, what are you most focused on? I mean, how do you evaluate yourself? Is it course evaluations, or do those get old after a while? And, you know, uh, you know, course evaluations those? never get old if they're telling you you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I hand out the course evaluations or when they're getting handed out, I'm getting ready to leave the room and I tell the students, okay, I need one thing from you. I need at least one idea on how to make this a better class. And kind of the quality of those suggestions, I think, helps me know whether or not I kind of got through to them. Because if I get a real honest answer for, you know, here's something you need to change or here's something you need to try, that helps me know that they're engaged and, and they kind of know the point of everything. Uh, if those answers are kind of crappy, I realize I probably didn't get through to them as well as I should have. Um, I used to exclusively rely on the end of the semester teaching evaluations, but it was at the end of the semester there was nothing I could do for those students. Uh, so a few years ago I started uh, putting a, a survey uh, on Qualtrics and I asked my students to go on there and fill it out. I think uh, in week three of the semester, mm -hmm. which allows me to make some tweaks, changes, and sometimes I get some really nasty comments on those, and, and, and that's okay with me. I mean, that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear the good comments. And the good comments at this stage of my career <laughs> don't mean much. I just want to learn from the students and how to improve, how to make their lives better how to make it, at least my make my teaching much more effective while they are there. So I think doing this middle of the semester, early in the semester, teaching evaluations of yourself are very important. The end of the semester teaching evaluations, I keep questioning myself how many students actually take those serious. I'd like to know from both of you what you think your biggest challenge is teaching millennials. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, top five. My <laughs> yeah, top five. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, without military training, <laughs> <laughs> obviously they don't read like like students used to. Yeah. You know, they read kind of the minimum they can possibly read. Used to doing everything on screens, and so I'm trying to do a few more videos and things like that, I'm trying to do a little bit more, like I'll cover stuff in class. Um, 
and then I've got a video that I know you know teaches that stuff pretty well. So I'll say, you know, if you don't think you got this from me, you know, you can go go check out this video of that stuff. Um, the students don't study as much as we used to, but what, at least on my campus, and I, I have the good fortune to teach mostly honors kids. The reason they don't is all the other stuff that they're doing on campus. They're involved in so many organizations. They're involved in so much philanthropic activity. Uh, they're starting their own companies. That's all great. That's just fabulous. And so I'm just having to accommodate myself to the fact that they're not studying as hard as I did when I was in college and my students did 15 years ago. But they're compensating for it by going out and really becoming better, more well-rounded people and making the world a better place. So I can't really, I, I, I'm trying to get past that and not complain about it too much. That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges I've had was this constant thing in the classroom. And initially, I had a hard, strict policy. You're not allowed to use phones, laptops, tablets. And some of you may have those policies in your classroom. I do. <laughs> um, I'm a real hard ass on that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but I lost the battle. So, <laughs> That's okay. uh, so I, I started thinking, how can I use those things to my advantage, as opposed to, I know they are going to do it one way or another. They are going to glance at their phone. They are going to check Facebook. They are going to post something on Facebook. I hope they are not taping uh, taping me and putting me on YouTube or something like that when I say something stupid, which is uh, usually the case, but anyway. Um, but how do I engage the students with the things that they already use? And I felt Echo 360 was something that they can do, and they can use their smartphones, they can use their tablets, they can use... Uh, their laptops to do that, and they have to be on there because it shows you if they get off and do something else. Mm -hmm. And I let them know about that. Mm -hmm. and one other thing I'll just say is I, I know that I think differently than they think. And I know that's a challenge for teaching. Yeah. And I'm going to say to you what I say to everybody, and I really mean this, and I need to say it as much as possible so I actually live up to it. When my evaluations start to slip, I'm retiring. I'm just walking out the door. So far they haven't, but when that happens and I'm not as effective as I've been for 35 years, I'm going to go do something else. Robert, I know you mentioned um, you visit the other classrooms of the teachers. Do you require them to visit your classroom and to listen to you? Uh, that would be cruel and unusual, so no, I don't. <laughs> but if they want to, I let them, but I encourage them to watch the master teachers in the business school, to go and see as many other people as possible because the one thing I'll say is every time you go watch somebody else teach, you either learn something you should do or something you shouldn't do. Oh, I was going to try that. Boy, that didn't work at all. Or I can see how that works so well for them, but I just don't have, like, uh, some of my colleagues, are they are great comedians. They're just hilarious as they can be. And I just realized, you know, that wouldn't work for me. Or it might have worked for me when I was in my 20s. It doesn't work for me when I'm in my 60s. And so I really think you can learn from other people. So I, I really encourage that, but I don't require it. And certainly not to watch me. <laughs> I agree. I, I don't encourage them to come to my classroom. I point to other good teachers. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you may want to observe this person or the other person. Um, I think it's also good for them to observe bad teaching as well. And they realize very quickly what bad teaching is all about. And gives them a lot of ideas on what not to do. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and never heard that before. Right? Yeah, Every couple months we have uh, workshops like this, yeah. and I encourage all my uh, faculty members uh, to uh, attend those. It's not a matter of recommending a bad teacher. I keep it open who they want right. to watch. Yeah. What are your thoughts and or experiences with the flipped classroom? I, uh, I haven't experienced it. I teach the way I've always taught and haven't given it a try. Yeah, me too. Me too. But for some, for many of my colleagues, they think it works great. And so probably I should try it, but 
I've had some success with what I've done, and so I'm reluctant to try something new. The last time I tried something new, it, it just, I ended up wondering, why did I try that? I just tried, uh, did a class completely different than I normally do, it, and it just it bombed over me. What was I, what was I thinking? That's a great point. I, I think it's important for you as a teacher to feel very comfortable about the things that you do in the classroom. I don't think you should do something because you feel you have to do them to follow the trend. If traditional lectures is the way that you feel makes you more, most comfortable and you think your students learn and you can document that, then that's the way that you teach. Mm -hmm. If flipping the classroom is the way to go and you feel comfortable with that, why not? It might be a dinosaur, but what, what is it? Flipping the classroom? Is that doing handstands or? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is it? So instead of being the sage on stage, you're more of a facilitator of their learning, and then basically they're doing homework in class. You would pre record little vignettes of your lectures, uh, almost like little YouTube videos. And so they, for their homework, they get to lecture at home and rather than listening to Sounds you. like University of Phoenix. That's just my <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am naturally here and automatically biased against it also, but I, there are lots of people at UT who swear by it. You say it just works great for them in lots of different disciplines. In business, including business? Including mm -hmm. business, yeah. Digital so, so we have one accounting class does it where they watch a pre-recorded lecture beforehand and then in class it's not working properly instead of listening about theory and definitions and stuff, I don't do it. One but class meeting or one whole course? Is a whole course, course. Oh, yeah. Whole course. Course. yeah. Maybe several. I yeah, guess there are multiple. Multiple, oh, okay. multiple. yes. Yeah. So that class time can be spent more mm -hmm. working problems, mm -hmm. discussing. Uh, well, I at least there's that, enough time during the classroom where the instructor's on the spot and not just abdicating their responsibility. Mm -hmm. exactly. No, it's still a it's still pretty active discussion. Yeah. It just takes out the 30 minutes of Oh, let okay. me define what a debit is and a credit is, or let me give you the So it is highly, highly interactive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. More I interactive. Think, I think a good example of that in business would be case analysis, mm -hmm. where a lot of the students do the discussion on a particular case. Mm -hmm. That could be yeah. an example yeah. of flipping. One, one question, and you say you have a lot of engagement in your class. That'd be interesting on how you get them engaged. Mm -hmm. And also, you say you teach honor. So is there any different engagement if you have honor students versus ones that are not so good? Because I find that when you have a class with a lot of good students, they tend to get engaged. But if they're not so good, they don't. And, and you know, you teach to the mid-range, or you teach, you know, how do you try to get students that are not interested to engage, or you ever had that problem? Yeah, well, uh, for the last 10 years, I've taught mostly honor students, and so they're all engaged. I can't get them to shut up, and every single hand in the class is up most of the time, and so that's, that is a wonderful thing. So when I used to teach non-honor students, uh, so these classes are 40 students, 30 to 40. When I used to teach non-honor students of 120, you know, I'd have, uh, in a class of 120, I'd have 30 kids like Matt with their hands up all the time asking questions, and so then it became my responsibility to rope the others in. And I, I do that most commonly by, uh, I've got a course outline they've got to follow, I've got factual scenarios, one, I'll call up somebody over here to read the factual scenario, somebody over here to tell me how they think it ought to come out, and then we all talk about, okay, now why was that? And I try to, over the course of, uh, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, out of the 120, I'll have 20 who volunteer, and I got 20 more that I can rope in. And then I keep track of who I broke in, mm -hmm. and so over the course of uh, a couple weeks, I can make sure that everybody in the class has been participating at least a little bit. And when they get time from doing that, then you, by the end of the semester, have more than just 20 or 30 raising their hands. What's your trick for making sure that you know who speaks and when? Because that's, that's hard for me to get out of the flow of the conversation to, know, to, to make a hash mark you know, on a piece well, of paper. Uh, on my course outline, before I come to class, I write down who I'm going to call on. Oh. So when I get to that, I know it's <coughs> this person and this person, and then after that I've got that written down. Mm -hmm. But then in my head, I keep track of who volunteered, who voluntarily rose their, uh, raised their hand, and as soon as I get out of class, I go back to my office and write down those names. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I tell everybody, this is important, and this is a big part of your class, is that great? How many students do you teach? Now 30 to 40 in most of my classes, but I, I, I That's pulled that off semi-successfully with 120. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Did you agree that you had a question? 
Yeah, no, I just wanted, this was uh, to the flipped classroom. I usually, I teach my organization behavior courses similar. I don't have pre-recorded lectures, but they do the readings or watch some videos that are readily available. So they learn material and then in the class period we have discussions, we look at cases and just kind of take deeper into material. So it's kind of a flip style because I don't talk about definition of things. Okay, what are color, what is culture, what is the different motivation theories. They read it up, they know them before, and then we actually apply them and uh, discuss them. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Do any of our esteemed PhD student guests want to ask a question? This is, there, this is a great opportunity. I know you were all engaged and have been in my class, so ask a question <laughs> if you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, a very basic, simple question. We've been talking about good teaching and star teachers. And you mentioned getting star teachers. So what is your, what are the criteria for star teacher? What would, how would you define a star teacher? What are the things you're looking for? For a star teacher? Yes, for somebody to <coughs> classify them as a star teacher. Um, for me, it's just somebody who is uh, very substantive. You know, I've got people who are very popular with students because, or I have in the past, had people who are very popular with students because they told great stories and mm -hmm. had big personalities and that sort of thing. That, that's not what I'm looking for. I want substance, and then I want the students to be very receptive to it. Because I just think if students are enjoying themselves and receptive, uh, you know, if you like the teacher, <laughs> you feel more responsibility to learn the material. You're going to try harder in class, you're going to study harder, and that, that's very important. So it's kind of those two things would be the, the biggest things I would look for. I do think the evaluations are, are pretty important for that, but they're not all I look for. I do look at, see what those grades are, uh, and then I also attend class to make sure that the material is being covered. And uh, you know, all of our lecturers know, in essence, this is the material you have to cover. This is what we expect you to do, and if you don't do it, you're going to be in trouble. Mm. I would like to add one more thing. I think impact outside the classroom is very important as well. Not just the students that you have in the classroom, but what other things that you do as a teacher or a star teacher to spread the word about teaching. I think that's important. Uh, whether you're doing workshop, workshops, mentoring your colleagues, uh, spending time to evaluate your peers, or review your peers and give them feedback. I think that's important for a star teacher to do. A lot of us are very focused on what we do in the classroom, and a lot of us do a good job in our own classrooms, but how do we spread the word out there about teaching? Well, it's been a pleasure hearing from you, and thanks again for your time. Great question. Take some food, please. Yes. <laughs> Very nice to join you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. 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 Yeah, I think that would be better. And you're going to